In a physics course, current voltage have very specific definitions that are easy to apply. In chemistry, you often use them without actually going through what the implications of them are. So what I want to do here is look at electrolysis through the lens of current, through the lens of voltage, and try and give you kind of a theme on what those are going to tell you about electrolysis reactions in chemistry. What, are the, what is the purpose of these two terms in chemistry? So what we're going to start with is electrolysis reactions. We're going to look at electricity being run through two different things. One is aqueous sodium iodide, one is liquid sodium iodide, okay? So in aqueous sodium iodide, we have four things available. We have sodium ions, we have iodide ions, and we have water. Now the water can do two different things though, and so we're gonna see this both in a little bit. That's different than running it through liquid sodium iodide. So you can actually melt salts. So if you melt salts, you'll have sodium cations and iodide anions that kind of break free from their bonds and are able to move around. There's no water present, so it changes the game a little bit. So we're going to look mostly at the aqueous solutions here, but first we need to put up some information. So here are some redox potentials for four different reactions. One is for the reduction of sodium ions to sodium metal. One is for the oxidation of iodide to iodide. One is for the reduction of water to hydrogen gas, and one is for the oxidation of water to oxygen gas. So if we go back and we look at electrolysis being run through sodium iodide, again, we have three different things available to us. We have sodium ions, iodide ions, and water. What we want to be able to do is compare these and say, well, well when we're pushing electrons onto these or we're removing electrons from these, which ones are easier or harder to do that? So sodium, what I want to do with sodium is I want to add an electron onto that to form sodium metal. So I'm pushing on it using an external battery. Well, this reaction has a voltage of negative 2.71 volts, and that voltage gives us an understanding of how challenging that process is going to be. So a negative 2.71 voltage means that it's going to require a lot of energy or a lot of force to push that electron onto that sodium relative to other chemicals. Okay. Now the iodide, I don't have a reaction for as a reactant. And it's really important that I understand that I need to look at this from the iodide itself. So I'm going to be taking iodide and turning them into iodine. Okay, so that means that the iodide in this process is going to be losing electrons potential. And that means that this voltage needs to get flipped from a positive to a negative 0.54 volts. So that gives me an inclination of how hard it is to remove the electron from the iodide to form the iodine. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare those both with the water. So, so this, we're looking at a reduction potentially. And so we want to look at, okay, when water gets reduced. So here water gets reduced, it gains electrons and forms hydrogen gas. So in order for me to push an electron onto a sodium ion, it requires an external voltage of positive 2.71 or more. To push electrons onto water to form hydrogen gas only requires a voltage of 0.83 volts from an external battery. So in other words, it's easier to push electrons onto the water than it is onto the sodium ions. So if you're running reactions where you have sodium ions in solution, you're not going to form the sodium metal. It is far preferential that you'll form hydrogen gas and hydroxide ions in the solution. So the voltage in this case gives us information about will something happen So in this case, we're looking at, you know, which of these two things will happen. Will I get the sodium to form or will I get the hydrogen to form? I'll get the hydrogen to form. So because this is a preferential voltage, we can tell the likelihood of that ability for the external battery to push electrons onto it. If you have an external battery, even if it's hooked up to 9 volts, you're still going to push those electrons onto the water instead of the sodium ions. Okay. Now if we look at the other case, the oxidation, which one's easy to remove the electrons from? Because we need a kind of circuit to flow electricity through the whole thing. So the iodide losing electrons has a voltage of negative 0.54 volts. The water losing electrons has a voltage, I think this is flipped, this is supposed to be a negative here, sorry, has a voltage of negative 1.23 volts. So this one is easier to have happen than this one is. And so what will happen is we'll form iodine rather than forming oxygen gas. So when we have this setup here where we're running electricity through an aqueous solution of sodium iodide, this up to a battery. 
So here's our negative terminal, here's our positive terminal. Electrons are going to flow out of here. We're going to have reduction occur here. So here we're choosing between the sodium ions being reduced or the water being reduced. Here we're going to form hydrogen gas. We'll also form some hydroxide. At this one, this is where electrons need to come off of this from the solution somewhere so that we continue on the circuit back to the positive electrode. So there we're looking at iodine, iodide reacting, or we're looking at water reacting. Well, in this case, the iodide is going to form iodine. And we're going to start to see kind of a brownish, yellowish solution form around that electrode. Now, if we run electricity through liquid sodium iodide, that changes the game. Because now I don't have these other two reactions to look at. Now I just have these two. So I need to supply enough voltage for this to occur and for this to occur. But once I reach that point, the reaction will happen. So if I put up a one volt battery, nothing's really gonna happen. But if I put up you know, a nine volt battery, then all of a sudden I'm gonna form sodium metal at one end, and I'm gonna form iodine solid at the other end. Now in order for that to happen, this would have to be molten. So this would have to be at a high temperature. And something to consider is, if you're producing sodium metal, which will probably be a liquid at a high temperature, then you're looking at a case where you have an extremely reactive substance forming at a really, really high temperature, so that needs to be isolated. So if you have that in just air, and you're forming hot sodium liquid, that's gonna to start to burn. So you need to form that in a protected thing, like maybe put it under argon atmosphere or something like that, so that's not actually reacting when that occurs. So voltage tells us whether or not something will happen. And we can use that to figure out when we have competing Repeating processes, which one would occur? Now, current tells us how much. How much will we make? So, here we have a problem that's a coulombometry problem. We have a certain amount of current running through a solution for 20 minutes. How much copper is made? So, if we look up the reactions here, we have copper ions becoming copper with this voltage, and it's aqueous, so we could have the water gaining electrons from hydrogen gas. But we see here that the copper is preferential. It's easy to push electrons on the copper, much easier than it is to push them onto the water. So we're gonna form the copper metal over the hydrogen gas. Now we're running 2.4 amps of current through two liters. Uh, these are distractors here. So we're gonna start with our time here, and we're gonna use our current later to figure out how much of this we would form. We can work that out really quickly. So. 20 minutes, every one minute being 60 seconds, we can use our 2.4 amps as a conversion. So it's 2.4 coulombs per one second is what an amp is, a coulomb per second. So it's how much charge is flowing per unit time. And then we can change coulombs into electrons using the Faraday constant. So this is the charge of one mole of electrons. And now we can do a simple stoichiometry problem. So two moles of electrons gives us one mole of copper. And finally, we can go ahead and we can change moles of copper into grams using the molar mass. So we multiply everything on the top, divide by everything on the bottom, and we come up with 0.948 around to 0.95 grams of copper. So it looks like we should probably specify that with a little more certainty, but we'll assume it has more sig figs just for fun's sake. So, so current, if I were to increase the current, all of a sudden I were to do, you know, five coulombs per second, five amps. Or if I were to change the time, or I were to change the charge, any of those features would affect how much stuff I would produce. But, but really what current is about here is it's about how much electrons are you actually pushing. So voltage is kind of how much energy or how much force is required to cause something to happen. So that usually implicates on how much or, or will something happen. Whereas current is how much electrons. And so we get into how much product do you get. And that's kind of the big distinction between them. Now we're looking mostly at electrolysis here. So a lot of times that gets tricky when we go back and we start looking at galvanic cells. So here we have batteries. And then here, in an electrolytic cell, we have something that's happening that's non-spontaneous, which means we have something, so we have a redox process that's happening from an external battery. And the external battery is causing that reaction to go. And so this is how, how strong of an external battery do I need for voltage, or how much current am I getting out of it? That makes a lot of sense. 
when we look at galvanic cells, it gets a little trickier. So here, we're always looking at a positive voltage because we're looking at something that will be a battery on its own volition. We don't have anything external causing this to happen. So we're looking at positive voltages if we're looking at any kind of functional galvanic cell. So in that case, usually we're looking at two possible reactions and we're looking at which one gives us the positive voltage, which one will cause it to work. So this still works with what we were defining in electrolytic. A positive voltage is going to give us something where we're looking at a case where this will happen. Okay, so again, voltages, will it happen? If the voltage comes out to the negative, then that's not going to happen. Okay? Now the current, in this case, is something that we don't look at very much. Okay, so usually in chemistry, we're not looking at how much current do we draw from a battery, or at least not at the introductory chemistry level. Maybe if you get into chemical engineering, that becomes more of a concern, and you need to look at you know, electrode size and things like that. But, but really, we're usually not concerned with how much current do we draw from our battery. Because we're looking at the battery function usually, not looking at what we use it for. Okay? So if we were to look at the current, that would be tricky. We could again see how much could you, could you kind of influence or cause with your battery. But, again, this, this is rare, that we would look at current and that. I've never seen that, to be honest. I don't even know why I said rare. Okay, now if we're coming over to electrolytic, here we're looking at a voltage that's usually negative. Okay, so when we're looking at a voltage that's negative, we're looking at, will it happen? And in the case of aqueous solutions, we're looking at which. So usually here in aqueous solutions, we're looking at two different ions and comparing them to water. Are these easier to reduce? Or are these easier to oxidize than water? If not, then the water is going to react. If so, then the ions are going to react. And if they're really close, sometimes it can depend on concentration. Chloride turning into chlorine gas is highly concentration sensitive because it's right around the same voltage, negative voltage, as what water is. Okay? Now if we're looking at current, then we're looking at how much will we get. How much product will we get? Um, how much electrolysis will we get? So current is how many electrons in a given time. And so if we add in the time factor, then we really can go through and say, this is how much, this is the amount of product and, and that. And so usually voltage and current get distinguished over here in electrolytic cells. They both function in on galvanic at some level. Really the current is, is largely ignored. But the voltage we look at for both, and a lot of people kind of mix them up. So, so for instance, something that I see a lot is when, when people see sodium ions turning into sodium, and they see a negative 2.71, I think, or 2.91, when they see that voltage, they apply things they've learned in galvanic cells, and they say, oh, I need to flip this. But you're not starting with sodium metal. That's not something you can decide to do in that case. Now, in a galvanic cell, oftentimes you're starting with the ion and the metal itself. And so in that case, you can figure out should this be getting reduced or should it be getting oxidized? And it depends on what it's connected to. You're trying to find a positive voltage. Over here, you're looking at a case where you have a negative voltage and you're trying to figure out will it happen? So you're locked into, I have to start with sodium ions, that's all I have, I don't have any sodium metal. So a lot of people will try and misapply things that they, they connect over in galvanic cells with what they've learned with electrolytic cells. And it gets very confusing. Now, if you kind of have this theme undermined, then it becomes a little bit clearer, although it definitely requires some practice to kind of figure it out.